tragedy that has befallen their neighbors. This past fall, the city of Waco uh, came together in a project, it's an annual project, called One Book, One Waco. And the title of the book, chosen by those who are wise about such matters, was a book entitled, Where Dreams Die Hard. And it was a book about a little town here in Central Texas called Penelope. A sweet name for, for a town. And the book was ostensibly about the restoration of a six-man football program. But in its own way, it was a Tocquevillian essay about the goodness of the people uh, in this community. And because of the tiny nature of Penelope, uh, its size, as the world measures these things, when asked, where is Penelope, the proper response was, we are east of west. <laughs> <laughs> west, therefore, became famous by virtue of this very well-received book around the nation, but obviously sold uh, like Dr. Trevor Floats, so welcome uh, here in this community. So we do remember the tragedy and the cruel ironies that comes on the heels of the tragedy uh, in Boston, the 21st century of Boston uh, massacre. The two episodes have something in common. As far as we know, the tragedy last evening in the West was truly an accident. We will know the causes of what happened with the ammonia tank plant and so forth in the fullness of time. It would appear that through good police work we are finding out a lot about the Boston Massacre. The Boston Massacre from all that appears was entirely the handiwork uh, of terrorists, whether domestic uh, or otherwise. The point is those tragedies arose out of private action and private conduct. What this conference asks us to reflect on is a different kind of tragedy. It's hard to speak of it without emotions arising rather quickly. <clears throat> this is a tragedy that involved in a very direct and most profound uh, and forever be remembered way uh, the force of government. So it's not a private action. It's the force of government engaging private action. And so I thought for our very brief welcome this morning, it would do well simply to sum it up the authoritative source of the purpose of government. I could draw from scripture, remember the Caesar, what is Caesar, and the God, what is God. It seems to me, however, more appropriate, even in this sacred place, the Paul Powell Chapel at Truett Seminary, to draw from the words of the preamble to America's Constitution. Our forebears decided we wanted to have a written Constitution, not as our mother country has and had an unwritten Constitution. So let me get the words right. I hope you all carry a copy and get you a copy of the that I quite serious. At Bailey University, we require all students to take the American constitutional tradition. And that's not uh, a reform from yesterday or the day before. It's been the practice at Bailey University for 60 years. So we're thankful for that practice. We the people. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. Every federal official, and I hope every local Whatever his or her responsibility may be, 
either swears an oath or a conscience, so guides and affirms uh, fealty to the Constitution and thus its enduring values. Now, note the structure, and I close with this reflection. In order to form a more, form a more perfect union, it was a response to the exigencies of the time. But those purposes of government would follow are enduring. It's not just to fix the Articles of Confederation. That was an 18th century problem. But just as securing the blessings of living to ourselves and to our posterity is looking to the future, not just to the present, so too establishing justice, it's up to us to maintain it. Ensure, so there it is, that's an insurance provision, domestic tranquility, so there will be peace in the land. And then provide for the common defense, looking to the possibility of <coughs> those who wish us ill, perhaps Boston, promote the general welfare, not welfare not of the few, not of those of that generation, but the general welfare, and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. In a very real sense, this gathering today, Paul Powell Chapel, is a reflection of these enduring values of our almost sacred Constitution. Welcome to Baylor University, the oldest continuing operating university in the state of Texas, founded before the state was a state. Thank you and welcome.
The various religious dimensions of the tragedy are at its heart. And so I take the work done here today to be an example of precisely the kind of educational experience Baylor University and the Baylor Religion Department seek to provide. Learning really only comes with reflection. And so I'm grateful that we are all here taking time to reflect on a tragic and important event. It raises many questions with implications for our culture. Each day our society faces the question of how to balance the desired openness of our democratic system with the need for security. We have seen that again this week in Boston in troubling and painful ways. And what difference does it make when those causing trouble for society constitute a religious group. These questions stay with us. The emphasis today will rightly be on historical and cultural perspectives, but I remind us that the religious and ecclesial are central to those perspectives in our society. So again, I thank you for coming today for coming to reflect and to learn and to contribute. The kind of reflection we do here today suggests a thriving democratic society, one that treasures uh, the freedom and responsibility to reflect and to learn, a free state that embraces freedom of religious expression without an established faith and also embraces the it was uh, certainly predictable for those of you who don't know that Judge Starr would quote the Constitution. And for those of you who don't know me, it is certainly predictable that I would quote the Old Testament. So I finish with that. It was the teacher in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Hebrew Scriptures who reminds us that all kinds of days come from our Creator. And so, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, reflect. I am glad to invite us all to inform reflection today, and I am glad to be here to participate and to learn. So welcome to you again.
a rat. And so they picked on a little survivalist named Ray Weaver. And they told Ray, he want you to go over and join the Iran Brotherhood. And he said, no. You know, I'm, I'm not like that. I don't agree with them on anything. Well, they kept pushing it. Now, it turns out that Weaver is a sideline to help support himself and his kids and his wife. Fix guns. He'd buy them at uh, state sales and whatnot, clean them up, resell them. So they, the feds arranged for somebody to buy a shotgun from him. Then they took it and cut it off, making it an illegal sawed-off shotgun. And they charged Weaver with selling an illegal sawed-off shotgun and told him they persecuted him, prosecuted him, and do all the rest if he wouldn't go over there and be an informant for them with the Brotherhood. He still told them to go fly a kite. So they charged him and uh, sent out a trial date. He didn't show up. So they got a bench warrant. But they were reluctant to serve it somehow because they thought, you know, this guy really he knows we framed him. So what they did is they sent six federal marshals got up in body armor, covered up in camouflage suits and armed with automatic M16s to go out and hide in the bushes around his, his cabin, hoping that he would come out and wander around like a jumper. But what happened is the dogs started sniffing, and Weaver's son Sammy, age 14, and a neighbor named Kevin Howard, decided the dogs were smelling game. And most of the survivors out there. They were, most of the meat was coming from deer and whatnot that they were popping. And so the two took their 22 caliber rifles and followed the dog. And the dog, of course, went right up to one of the thickets where there was a federal marshal all decked out hiding. And what he did was shoot the dog. And here's a kid, his dog's just been shot in the bush, so he snaps off the shot with his 22 and he starts running. And the marshal stood up and went out a burst, shot him in the back and killed him. And the neighbor, Ken Harris, popped off a shot and killed the marshal. And then he ran into the gap. And then there was a whole lot of shooting. And then things quieted down for a while. And then Weaver, of course, got his rifle down. And uh, they were sitting in their cabin. And uh, one of the snipers could see Mrs. Harris through a window through the back of the cabin. So he shot her, killed her. Um, eventually, the FBI guy came in and, 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 and got Harris to surrender. And they charged him with murder. Now, what's interesting is, for one reason or another, the press in Boise and in Spokane and in Seattle got it right from the very beginning and were raging about these events. I was at the University of Washington at the time, so I was reading all of this. But the feds, of course, proceeded to charge him with murder, and uh, nothing was done to investigate anything, and everybody moved on to Waco. As it turns out, ultimately, of course, Weaver was totally exonerated. I mean, they tried him for murder, and the jury was out 10 minutes. Uh, the defense attorney didn't even put on a defense. He just said, you know, we discredited the, the federal witnesses. There's no need for defense. No one. And the federal uh, investigation finally revealed all the things I'm telling you was actually being true. Um, nothing was done. But had someone in a responsible position done anything about these people and, and their notion that, that to go hide in witches and shoot at kids, maybe Waco wouldn't have happened. I'd like to think that that's true. In any event, I wanted us not to forget the affair at Ruby Ridge as we proceeded this morning to remember another tragedy. Thank you very much. Okay, we're ready to start and uh, we're going to ask Bill Pitts to come up and get us launched. Thank you, Barbara. Good morning to all and welcome. I'm Bill Pitts, member of the Department of Religion here at Bayonne. 
Welcome to our first session. The theme of this session is introducing the branch divisions. Our first speaker this morning is J. Gordon Melton. Dr. Melton is a distinguished professor of American religious history at Baylor's Institute for Studies of Religion. Dr. Melton has devoted his scholarly career and work to the study of American religion. He is responsible for the publication of numerous significant books, articles, and reference materials, including Melton's Encyclopedia of American Religion, and more recently, the award-winning Religions of the World, a comprehensive encyclopedia of belief and practice. Dr. Melton is a leading scholar in the study of new religious movements. He has provided inspiration and leadership in organizing this conference. It's most appropriate that we hear his perspectives as we begin. Dr. Melton will address the topic of Ranch Davidians and Texas religious history. Dr. Melton. I'm the one who gets blamed for putting all of this together today. But it's one of the things that it's one of the things that I have learned since I have been here is that uh, what Byron told me when we were talking about my moving here about the staff, I discovered it was true. I've worked with a lot of uh, good staffs in my town, but the staff we have here at the institute studies of religion is the best I've ever worked with. It's, I have felt like I got an extra set of arm. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you met probably Francis Malone and uh, Leon Moore when you uh, came in. Uh, they were the ones who greeted you and gave you their badges. Uh, Cameron Andrews is sitting here and June Pasco is floating around somewhere who is uh, been my colleague and assistant. Uh, she's been a friend of mine for 40 years. Uh, the last 10 years, uh, we've worked very closely together. Um, they're the people who really put this conference together. And I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you to them. And if you had joined me. together 
this day. It brings together two things that I hope that the Institute we will be doing over the next few years. One is to uh, continue our study of new religions. Once I got down here, I discovered that uh, more than half of the faculty members associated with the Institute have a history of writing and working on the area of new religions. Uh, for those of you who are uninitiated, new religions are what we used to call cults back in the good old days. Uh, it's not as uh, handy a term as cult, but it's the one we live with and, and work with. And it's become an important topic, both nationally and internationally, since the 1960s. Uh, and next year, uh, we will be hosting uh, the International Conference uh, that gathers every year of scholars from around the world who study new religions. Uh, we, Baylor hosted that conference one time, some six or seven years ago, but uh, the Sedgwick Conference will be returning here. Secondly, we have initiated a program in Texas history. The event that the speakers will be talking about today is an event that uh, has greatly affected both McClendon County and all of Texas. Uh, but it's an issue that uh, most of them have been thinking about for the last 20 years. Uh, one of the things that I brought with me today is a copy of this book, From the Ashes, Making Sense of Waco. This was the very first scholarly book about the Branch Davidian incident. Uh, six of our speakers have chapters in this book from 20 years ago. So the people that you will be hearing today are people who have thought about this almost from the day that it happened and have been reflecting upon it in that length of time. It's an important event that we will periodically reconsider for a long, long time into the future. We will do that because of the number of deaths that occur. It is the largest number of deaths that have happened in an American law enforcement incident. And just for that fact alone, it will be an incident that uh, both people in law enforcement, people in religion will continue to look at. We now live in a context in which uh, odd incidences of violence that we didn't expect 24 hours before they happened occur. Um, I woke up this morning like probably many of you to learn what happened in West last night as I was eating dinner. Um, I woke up morning a couple of days ago to learn what happened in Boston. Uh, those kinds of incidents happen uh, to us and they are part of the context in which we now live as we have so many people around the world who have access to explosives, have access to guns, and who have evil intentions, or, or just accidentally are around when things occur. We also live in a context in which religious pluralism is part of our lives. Uh, we now live in a country in which there are at least 2,300 different denominations of religion. There are a hundred Buddhist groups, there are several hundred Hindu groups, there are 50 or more Muslim groups, uh, over a thousand Christian denominations. And while on the one hand, the great majority, over half of the American people are members of a mere 23 groups, the rest of us are spread out among groups that if we stop to take a look at, we might wonder, is this really religion? Is this something that uh, we should be concerned about? Because the whole religious spectrum of the world now is here in the United States, is now here in Texas. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, so that we have to learn to live with people who 
think differently from us, who have a different religious perspective, who have some ideas that, upon first consideration, we might think are pretty odd, pretty strange, behave somewhat differently. But just for those reasons alone, the Branch Davidian incident becomes important. As we approach the Branch Davidian incident and the things that happened at Mount Carmel, we do so with many questions. And probably by the end of the day, we'll have more questions than answers. What we do know to start with is that the primary stories that we have told each other over the last 20 years about what happened at Mount Carmel quickly fall apart with the least bit of examination of that vast amount of material that is now available to us concerning what happened. The first story we commonly tell is the destructive cult story. This is the story that says the folks at Mount Carmel were part of an evil, small, confined local religious group who had evil intentions uh, toward their neighbors and maybe even toward some of their members. It's a popular story. We've told it over and over about different groups that our neighbors are members of uh, over the last generation or two. The second story is the deluded psychopath story. That is that the folks at Mount Carmel were a bunch of deluded people who had been suckered in by a religious fanatic who was psychologically unstable and who uh, brought them to their end. In both of those stories, the folks at Mount Carmel got their just results, more or less. The third story we tell is the story of the evil government conspiracy that the uh, government uh, is acting to suppress uh, all of the uh, odd kinds of folk who would uh, exercise their rights to religious freedom. But those stories just don't work for very long. Once you start looking at the evidence, the folks at Mount Carmel were our neighbors. They're very much like our neighbors today. People who live next door to us. They're not perfect folk, but they're good folk. When you meet the survivors from Mount Carmel, these are people I meet every day wandering around the city. That I've lived with my whole life. Their strange misfortune is no higher than mine. I suspect if I sat and talked with you for any length of time about what I believe, you'd find I hold some pretty strange ideas too. I, I believe that a 30 year old carpenter from a part of the world I've never been to is the clue to the meaning of the universe. That's a pretty strange idea in most of the world. The folks from Mount Carmel, basically moral people, basically people who were trying to find out what the Bible meant and how they fit into the picture that the Bible was painting. That's what we do at my church. The main reason the first two stories fall apart is because of the, the significant religious continuity between what was happening in Mount Carmel and what was happening in the other churches around Texas, what's still happening today. There are still people, a lot of people, 
who are concerned about the end of the world, who are trying to figure out Bible prophecy, who are trying to place themselves in the context of Bible prophecy and figure out what's going to happen next. The folks at Mount Carmel were doing the same thing that some very popular radio pre television preachers are doing now, that some of the preachers in the largest churches in Texas are doing. They're not that different from us. They're not psychopathic cultists. They're not destructive religionists. They're people who happen to get caught up in events that were bigger than their community was. The same holds true when you turn to the government. I share many of the views that Professor Stark just articulated with us. But again, as I've met the people who were involved in both the incident at uh, Mount Carmel and other incidents like that, I, I find the same kind of humanness. Not members of a big government conspiracy to wipe out our freedoms, but people who were fallible, who made bad decisions, and who were very misinformed as to what was going on. As a matter of fact, it was someone who had never visited Mount Carmel, knew nothing about it, who convinced the BATF agents who made the original raid on Mount Carmel that they were an evil, destructive cult. Badly misinformed and working off of bad information. Through the days of the siege and right on up to the end, number of bad decisions that were made. Decisions that not only overstepped constitutional uh, boundaries, but overstepped boundaries of good law enforcement. And along with it, just like we live our lives, a certain level of incompetence that showed up. Again, not evil people, but less than perfect people who got involved. Now, as we go through the day today, we're going to hear from people who have devoted their, the last 20 years of their life, a good part of the last 20 years of their life, to trying to understand uh, what happened here 20 years ago. I don't think they're going to present a consistent worldview to us. I think they, they are coming from different places. And the, the opinions they have and the Maybe may in conflict, but they are people who have been thoughtful. They're the best people that we could find to come and talk about this particular uh, incident for you. Uh, as I said, most people have been at it for, since the time that it happened. While we can agree that the simple stories do not work, I suspect that no common story will will emerge today, but I hope we will emerge more informed. We will begin to understand some of the complexities of the event that uh, happened, that we will open some questions for ourselves as we try to consider what we're going to think about what happened in the future. I think there are no heroes and no villains but people just getting caught up in events that are big, bigger than what we are. And with those words, I will close my remarks, turn the podium back over to Bill, and I hope that you have an enjoyable day and that the efforts that the Institute has put in to putting this together will, will work for us. Thank you.
you, Gordon. Our second presenter this morning is Matthew Whitmer. Mr. Whitmer is a librarian in California, specializing in the collection and preservation of primary sources related to the British Dominions. Mr. Whitmer also recently assisted in editing Clive Boyle's significant book, A Journey to Waco, an autobiography of a branch to be. Mr. Whitmer's presentation is a pictorial introduction to the Mount Carmel property. just a little bit back by the door. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again. Thanks to ISR, thanks to the department, and everybody who's made such a gracious welcome, and it's an honor to speak here today. Yeah, we can go back down if it's possible. It's photographs like this one. Photographs like this are really how I first learned about Mount Carmel, and I think it's how many of 
much as the American public first learned about the Mount Carmel property. I began visiting this building, or this property, or the property, I should say, where this building once stood, seven years after it was destroyed in the fire. In the last 20 years, there's been many memorial efforts made on that property, like the rebuilt chapel that you can see circled here. But many memorial efforts and monuments have sort of come and gone on the property, like the makeshift altar you can see on the right-hand side of the photo. Dozens of memorial trees have been planted in the soil of that land, and today they still grow there, but they're in a different arrangement than you see in this photograph. This is a photo taken two years ago and representative of what the property looks like today. Now this land was actually the second location for a religious community in Waco that began around 1935. It was a group that was known or referred to themselves as the Davidians. The group was founded by, oh I'm sorry, it, the, uh, sorry, just one second. There are two sites in the city of Waco that are kind of have their roots in the branch Davidian history. The first site was the one that we're all familiar with, it's east of the city. It's called, it's referred to as New Mount Carmel. Here, pardon me just one second, I need to double check my presentation. So although the site that we're familiar with, the David Koresh lived on east of the city, had been branched to the land from 1965 forward, it was initially purchased for Davidians who were moving from an old site that was located in the west of the city that you can see here, known as the Old Mount Carmel site. Let's take a look at some of the remaining traces available at that location. At least five streets in that area still bear the names of former Davidians from this initial location. There are still a couple buildings in that area that I think are worthy of mention circled above. This Davidian church today still bears the name of Mount Carmel Center. And behind this is the one-story building that was once the print facility for Victor Howeth, the original Davidian founder in the 1930s. This is that print shop which produced religious literature that was mailed to colleges throughout the world between the 1930s and 1950s. Today, Vanguard Preparatory College across the street from this chapel was initially Victor Howitt's administration building in the 1940s. This is Branch Davidian siege survivor Clive Doyle and Sheila Martin, who took me to that building and helped me understand the history back a few years ago. Now to get to the new Mount Carmel property that's east of the city, you can see the Baylor Circle below and Loop 340 Circles Waco. It's just about six miles east of the city on Car Road 2491. And you go north on Double E Road for about a half mile, and you can find the property on your right hand side. This bird's eye property sketch is taken from the Treasury report, and I show it because it shows the layout of the land in 1993. If you look at the bottom, that's Double E Ranch Road, and this is the driveway that circled the building that the community had constructed in the early 90s. If you look at the bottom right hand side of this slide, you can see the property fence that you'll come to before reaching the driveway. And just inside this property fence sits a very small cemetery that was once called Green Acres. In Green Acres Cemetery, at least 11 people have been buried over the years by both the Davidians and the Branch Davidians. Both of these women did survive the siege of 93 and they're buried in the cemetery. However, Tilly Friesen's husband, Raymond Friesen, and Edna Doyle's granddaughter, Sherry Doyle, were both killed during the events of 93. The name markers and headstones in the cemetery have been moved around, they've been mowed over, and many have been destroyed over the years, so it's hard to get a sense of where the graves are actually located. Now this is a composite photo taken during the 1993 siege of David Koresh's Mount Carmel Center building. You're looking at the front west side, which is mostly residential rooms. If you look at the photographs right in the back, you can see that there was a gymnasium that I circled here. And on the far left, there was a, an old concrete barn that was known as the Dairy Barn, used in the Davidian era in the 1950s. 
This is the central residential tower that was made so famous during the 1993 siege through many of the photographs published in the media. Now, in order to get an understanding of what is on the property today, you have to look at the 1993 layout of, of the buildings during the siege. The building that I highlight next was actually the chapel portion of the complex. It was David Koresh's chapel. There's a swimming pool foundation that was built in 1992 that's slightly north and east of that, which is highlighted here. And to the north of the swimming pool foundation sits an underground tornado or storm shelter that was being constructed at the time of the February 28th raid that you can see highlighted there. You can actually access the inside of the underground storm shelter from inside the building by traversing through a buried school bus that was located here. Now keep your eyes on the swimming pool as I transition to the next photograph, which is an aerial satellite image taken just this past winter, and it gives you an idea of some of the concrete remains still on the property today. You can see that this building has been reconstructed where the former chapel once stood, and these squares that are highlighted here indicate foundations that still exist on the property from the Davidian houses from the 1950s. Those houses were dismantled in the early 90s to help build the communal building being so famous. Now this is the memorial model of the building that I created in 1999. Behind the residential row of buildings sat the chapel, which is highlighted here sort of in a blue color. Behind the chapel was a gymnasium that I tent with sort of a purple color. You couldn't actually access the gymnasium through the chapel because at the time of the, of the raid, it was a new building and it was only accessible through an outside door. Now in 1998 and 1999, volunteer efforts joined together to rebuild the chapel for the 1993 siege survivors. And by 2000, this building was dedicated and today it actually sits directly over the footprint where the former chapel once stood, although the current chapel is a little bit larger in scale than the former one. I'd like to take a look at the property again from 1993, but only from the vantage point of the gate. This is a screenshot from the video taken directly after the initial raid on February 28th. You can see ATF agents walking away from the building. If you look at the two telephone poles underneath the first two arrows, those exist on the property today and served as mapping points in helping me understand how large the building was. Behind the third arrow is a three-story residential tower in which obscures David's chapel. And that's where the chapel that was reconstructed in 2000 sits today, as seen in this diagram. Now, as I transition to a photo taken just two years ago, you can see that 82 memorial trees line the property's driveway today. The reconstructed building that you see is just simply one, and it's the smallest building of that 1993 complex that's kind of overlaid here. All of the five buildings that were in the 93 layout were completely destroyed on the 19th and in the culminating fire that occurred just after noon on that day. This is one of the telephone poles that sat closest to the chapel then, and it sits closest to the chapel today. And this is that same telephone pole from that April 19th. You can see it just outside the gymnasium amidst the tank tracks that circled the complex. And this is the back side of the building where a kitchen that you can see here was located. The kitchen was right next to the central residential four-story tower it was built over an old church records vault from a previous building on the property. It's referred to as a bunker sometimes in government reports. The vault was actually the only standing structure within the building after the April 19th fire. And as you can see, there's only one way in and one way out of the vault. It's a door that faced westward, and if you look at my diagram with the small box, it was located here. The only way to get to the top or upper levels of that residential tower was to enter from the west second level run of rooms from the front of the complex through a very small corridor which was circled here. This is actually where David Koresh was situated throughout much of the 1993 siege after he was wounded on the February 28th gun. gun okay. It was inside this concrete room where the bodies of 15 children were discovered as well as five women. 
The concrete room was bulldozed into a pile of rubble shortly after all of the evidentiary value was gathered. The largest concrete structure to remain on the property intact, besides um, the concrete vault that was actually destroyed, was the swimming pool foundation that you can see highlighted here, as well as a large concrete slab that was the former floor of the gymnasium that sits behind the reconstructed chapel today. And to the north of both of these structures, you can see the underground storm shelter, which has been collecting rainwater for some time. I'd like to step back and look at the property before the Branch Dividends were on it. This is an aerial photo taken probably from the late 40s or early 50s before any buildings were actually on the property. This is where the driveway would eventually be established when the Davidians moved here and purchased the land. So initially this was how does the Davidian community has moved here from Old Mount Carmel site. You can see that there was a lot of building activity on this slide. But remember by 1965 this would become Branch Davidian property when the property was managed by Branch founder Ben Roden and his wife Lois. Let's take a look at three buildings on the property. The one that circled first, the lower portion of this photo, is a chapel that was built in the 50s and it lasted until the late 1980s. It was used by both the Davidian and Branch Davidian communities, and in 1989, half of the building was dismantled to begin to build the communal building on the administration building site. Eventually, the entire chapel was taken down. The next building is a driveway's corner. It was the home of Ben and Lois Roden. You can see that those two houses behind this picture of David Koresh and David and Harry Jones. All three men were found killed in the remains of the 1993 fire. The next and largest building from the Davidian era was the administration building. The administration building kind of had an I-shaped layout and it was nestled around that church records vault that you can see here notated by the square. The back portion of this building was a print shop that was used first by the Davidians and later by the Branch Davidians to send to print religious literature that was mailed to colleges pretty much all over the world. To the north of the administration building sat 13 small residential houses in which a woman named Catherine Madison had lived for many years. Catherine Madison was Lois Roden's assistant after Ben Roden passed away. And she would later go on to become a part of David's community, and she would bring out David's message that was a radio sermon message early in the 1993 siege. Catherine passed away in the city of Waco in 2009. These two women were also a part of the, of the Branch Davidian community, and you can see them standing here in front of those little residential houses in the 1980s. Both women came out of Mount Carmel on March 19th, 20 days into the, into the siege. Behind those houses in the Davidian era, there were 11 large storage barracks that lasted for about two decades. Some were dismantled, others had fallen down, and one was destroyed by a fire. To the east, or at the top of the photo, also sat the cinder block dairy barn that was used in the Davidian era. Now in 1983, an accidental electrical fire completely destroyed the administration building, and you can see its footprint highlighted here in the gray portion. And as you can see, the only thing remaining from that building is that one-level church records vault that I highlight here. This is how the property appeared for the next several years when Branch founder Ben Roden's son, George Roden, moved onto the property and renamed it Rodenville Branch Center. George had a history of mental instability and a volatile temper, and at this time, David and his community lived on a tract of land in Palestine, Texas, for several years. In 1987, George was arrested, and David and community then moved back onto the property and began building a community residential center over the site of where the administration building had once existed. You can see that building in its early phases of construction from this Channel 2 News screenshot from 1987, I think. This is the same building, a picture taken from the Treasury report, and this section of the building that I highlight here is what we were just looking at. You can see that a chapel has been added and is extending eastward and it added two additional second story level bedrooms. This is the same time frame, only looking westward. This is Double EE Road 
And this tract of land is where those storage barracks that once stood. In their place, you can see very tiny, small shacks that were actually some of the houses that were brought from the Palestine property and positioned here on the Mount Carmel property. And here's the building as it slowly started to develop. Now, in the 1990s, the community began dis disassembling those residential houses and reusing lumber to create both the four-story residential tower that you can see, as well as expand the building northward. Eventually, another three-story tower was added on the south end that I circled here. You can see before it has any windows. And eventually, by 1993, there was another identical tower on the north end of the complex. To see the interior layout of the building, I really encourage you to pick up a copy of Clive Boyle's autobiography, A Journey to Waco, which was published just this last year by Roman Littlefield. This is an overhead aerial photograph taken during the siege, but I've simplified it into a line drawing to call attention to just a couple things. The two houses on the very bottom of the slide that are orange were originally Davidian houses in the 1950s when the Davidians owned that parcel of land when they originally purchased the property. However, in 1992 and 1993, ATF and FBI agents used those houses as a forward-looking observation post during the 51-day siege. The dairy barn on the top of this pillar, or on the east end of the property, was also used as a similar post for government agents during the siege. You can see the building still exists, as it, and this is how it looked just this past year in April of 2011. Now there were two, the two, the swimming pool and the underground storm shelter here behind the complex actually acted as a natural barrier for the tanks throughout the siege as they could not approach the building that close from that uh, because of those structures. You can see those structures here in this government exhibit photograph as I shade them in gray. This was taken on April 19th as a tank entered the front part of the building to insert gas into the central residential tower into that one room concrete vault. If you look at the top of the photo, you can see a tank pulling away from the northeastern side of the gymnasium, which has been completely destroyed. This is an aerial photo of that same building, but from the first week in the siege. And the reason that I show it is because it gives you an idea when I transition to a photograph of how the property looks today of how much land space this building used to occupy. This is the swimming pool. After the fire and the vault and part of the storm shelter were bulldozed, the rubble of that concrete was stacked into the shallow end of the swimming pool where it sat for many years. This is a photo from 13 years ago, you can see the rubble at the far end. In, in the mid-1990s, a man named Charles Pace moved back, moved onto the property. Charles was not a part of David's community. Charles was not in the building throughout the 51-day siege. He is the person that now tends to the property's needs, and has been the sole person to kind of do that for the last six or seven years. He removed the rubble from the end of the swimming pool in the last three or four years. And as of this past year, he's removed all the water from the swimming pool and hopes to make it an aquaponic garden. Now this is the underground storm shelter seen 13 years ago. There was a covered end that you can see on the top and there was an uncovered end on the bottom. The uncovered end allowed rainwater to come in and slowly deteriorate the covered end of the shelter. The circled item is a school bus that can be seen during the 1993 siege footage. It sat north of the complex, right about here, and it was on the property up until about seven or eight years ago when it was removed, probably sold for scrap metal. This is a shot of the underground storm shelter again as it began to fall apart in 2009. The storm shelter is where survivor Clive Doyle had buried J.D. Wendell, Winston Blake, Peter Hipsman and Perry Jones. All four were killed in the shootout that occurred on the 28th, and they were buried in the storm shelter during the negotiation phase of the events. This is the dividing wall that separated those two covered and uncovered portions. By 2010, rain had completely filled the foundation, destroying most of the covered in. And again, this is that dividing wall. You can see me as I'm walking along the top of that dividing wall and everything to the photographs left has been removed by the 
property resident Charles Pace. Branch Davidian survivors planted memorial trees that were crepe myrtle trees on the property two years following the fire. Those trees have existed on the property until this day and are really the longest memorial effort to exist there since the fire. They were originally positioned in front of where the building once stood in a grid-like fashion, as you can see right here. And this is the trees in 2008, these are the trees. And two, by 2000, each tree had been fitted with a personal name stone that showed the name, nationality, date of death, and the age of every branch of who was killed in the 93 siege. By 2006, Charles Pace had removed all these name stones from the individual trees and he stacked them at various places on the property. Years before he did it, I had gone to the property and created rubbings of the name stones. And I archive those today on my website, stormbound.org, where I devote one page to sort of chronicling visual history of the property. I also archive the grouping of names as created by the survivors because it kind of shows how, they're, how they want their family members to be remembered. It's grouped according to family. Now in April of 2009, Charles Pace uprooted, pruned back, and replanted all of those trees from their original location to along the property's driveway. As of the following year, they actually had taken root and could be seen blooming here. And as of last year, they seemed to be doing okay. Now there have been many private efforts to memorialize those killed in 93 by installing monuments on the property, but the, monument pro the monuments have been altered if they've lasted that long. This is one of the first efforts. It was a single stone with all the names of the Branch Davidians killed. It was originally positioned in front of where the trees sat, but Charles Pace moved that stone from that location to near the front gate, where eventually by 2010, he had actually positioned all the name stones to stack in two walls around it, eventually cementing all of them together into one large memorial. As of last year, a concrete floor was added it was equipped with flag post holes to fly flags from the countries of origin of everyone who was killed. You can see the flags there. Alongside one of the name stones also sits Charles Pace's marble sort of timeline progression of Branch Davidian and Davidian prophets. There's also a monument that honors the, the four ATF agents that lost their lives in the line of duty on that. February 28th shooting. Also, there's a Oklahoma City bombing that pays homage to the victims of that disaster that occurred on the anniversary of the Mount Carmel fire on April 19th. The large branch marble sign that sits at the property's front gate was also created by Charles Pace. And in 2006, the Waco Tribune Herald ran an article that basically highlighted this stone and talked about the theological differences between Charles Pace and survivor Clive Doyle. Both had shared and lived on the property for several years, and it was in 2006 that Clive decided to move back into the city of Waco after having spent nearly 30 years of his life on the Mount Carmel property and losing his teenage daughter, Sherry Doyle, in the fire on April 19th. So I showed these stones and trees to just let you know that they were originally survivor efforts to remember family and friends who were killed, but the reorganization of them by a non-survivor has left many of the survivors feeling as if their efforts to remember their loved ones as being stripped from them and really erased or obliterated. I'd also like to mention that Clive ran and operated a visitor center museum that was near the property's front gate for several years that exhibited government photographs from the trial, books about the events, survivor recollections were posted along the wall, and photographs from families of all of those killed were displayed in this museum. The museum's contents were packed up and went into storage when Clive moved out the property. And in the last seven years that I've been to the property, I found the building locked and empty. I thought I'd end with just mentioning that 30 of the 82 people who were killed in that event are buried in Waco's McLennan County Wrestling Cemetery. They're in rows 6 through 8. 
This is one of the stones for Cyrus Howe, who was eight years old when he died. Each of these stones is engraved with the Tarrant County's medical examiner's autopsy number. It can be seen at the base of the stone. Each of them starts with an MC, and I'm assuming that stands for Mount Carmel. You can confirm the number by looking at the first page of every autopsy report that is issued. I've always found the notion to inscribe a personal grave marker with an evidence number is very troubling because it seems to overlook the dignity that anyone who has died, or in this case, every one of them was killed, rightly deserves the location of their burial. Reston Cemetery is just south of Baylor's campus. It's just south of the more predominant Oakwood Cemetery. The plots there always remind me of the many people that live on the Mount Carmel property. The property itself, for me, has been a resource. It's been like a document. And as one of the FBI negotiators said to Steve Schneider on March 17th during the siege, he said, Steve, this property speaks to what happened here. And I think that that holds true today. You've seen that the survivor efforts to remember their family has met with resistance there. It's my hope that survivor voices and stories are afforded more venues like this where they can become a more permanent and have a more prominent place in the public record on this event. The tremendous amount of suffering that's been endured for the last 20 years, I don't think can ever be removed from that property. And the property will always be associated with the city. And I appreciate the school today takes a moment to remember that event and look at these issues um, and engage people in thinking about how things could have been done different or better. Thank you.